Okay. Um, so we've now moved. Uh, we've now can move forward from having think, thought about epithelial and connective, uh, connective tissue type neoplasms to some of the others, as it were. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so here's a, here's a lump again. I mean, it's an astonishingly large lymph node. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen one quite that big. But well done for finding it. But most people will be able to find that and think it was a there was a problem. Indeed. Okay, and then and this so, is a lymph node taken out, yeah, and then yeah, and this this these uh, pictures here are not in any way to do any sort of specifics, but just to, to point out the general principle that uh, tumours may do, may be derived from lymphoid cells, and we have the whole gamut of uh, of course Hodgkin's lymphomas versus non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, tumour grading and staging and so on. So it has, as I say, in its in its own right, just as soft tissue pathology has lymphoma pathology. Again, it's a very specialised area. Okay. Um, again, just to, to remind us to think about other cell lineages, other, t- other types of histogenesis, um, to think also about germ cell tumours. And this is a, a, a nice example, which uh, is, is perhaps well known, of the germ cell tumours derived from the ovary, that is the ovarian teratoma. Yeah, okay. So we're looking with a laparoscope down into the pelvis here. Here's the, um, the sigma comicum, the rectum, the uterus there, and then the fallopian tube on this side, the ovary will be under there somewhere. And then on the left-hand side... There's this great big ovary, there's obviously something going on. Absolutely. And so here now is a tumour t- cell type which is derived from germ cells, and we talk about uh, cells being here pluripotential. What does that mean? It means that here's a cell that can do more as anything. So because of its, of its very nature is that a germ cell is, is there to be uh, fertilised and then form a new embryo, when these germ cells become neoplastic, when they escape normal control mechanisms, the cells as they multiply can go down different routes uh, in terms of what they, they, they form. So an ovarian teratoma may show mature cell types derived from all embryonic layers. Mm-hmm. So there you have a tumour which can form skin, it can form hair, which you can see dramatically yeah. in, in the lower photograph. So, so this, is, this is the ovary being opened, isn't it? Absolutely. And then in yeah. here is his hair. His hair. I'm never going to eat candy floss again. <laughs> so this. so that, that, there you have it. And you have the, the lining of skin with, with hair, with sebaceous glands, sometimes uh, bizarrely uh, specialised structures like teeth can develop in these lesions. But also you may get mesodermal components, so you may get fat. Uh, you may indeed get uh, bone. Uh, you can get thyroid tissue. In fact, you name it, pretty much a teratoma yeah, can form. So you've got a pluripotent cell that can form anything because it's a germ cell. So it's a cell from a germ cell which will meet uh, one from, uh, from well, in this case, the female and the male get together and form a complete individual from that yes. those germ cell. So they can form absolutely anything. That's right. And now the, the, one of the tricky questions around teratoma is, is it benign or malignant? Now, the vast majority of ovarian teratomas tend to be mature teratomas, so-called, where all the cell types that we see are well differentiated and are, in fact, mature, and the tumour behaves in a benign fashion. You can, of course, get... Uh, and you can tell that, so because it's forming hair. Exactly. It's a, it's a proper anatomical structure. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean to say that sometimes teratomas, some of the cell elements in teratomas, may become abnormal and, in fact, indeed form malignant counterparts. So uh, nerve has a particular reputation in that sometimes neural elements in a teratoma can sometimes become malignant. Uh, and there are cases on record of, of thyroid tumours arising in the thyroid component of a teratoma. Mm. So it is, as I say, a bit of a, a variable uh, variable entity. What's, what's also interesting is that if we compare the ovarian teratoma with the testicular teratoma, so its counterpart in the male, they seem to behave in very different fashion. Whereas an ovarian teratoma, by and large, they tend to be benign lesions. The testicular teratoma tends to, unfortunately, be relatively... Um, it has a range of, of, of uh, behaviours, but the teratoma in the testis will often have a malignant potential. Yeah. I think that so, pathology is truly a fascinating subject. Yeah, for yeah. so it is very, very un- un- unpredictable. So you, just, just to, just to, to cover the basics there, David, you said yeah. you said something quite interesting about malignant tumours not responding to the normal controls of growth. Sure. Um, I mean, I think we there's. I mean, I'm not familiar with the molecular biology of this at all. But in general, what we're saying is that. In the body, the cell sits within an environment in which it's controlled very closely. It has cell surface uh, receptors and and, uh, and a local uh, uh, endocrine and paracrine uh, environment which controls what that cell does. It tells us what to do, uh, it tells the cell what to do, when to divide, when not to divide, and so on. And what we see in in malignant transformation of cells is that they escape those normal control mechanisms. Well, in neoplasia, not, not just malignant. Indeed, you're right. Uh, it's not just in malignant tumours, you're right. In, in any neoplastic uh, formation 
uh, tumor formation, there's going to be an escape from those control mechanisms. Sometimes the escape is only obviously to a degree whereby the tumor is going to be expansile but not malignant. It hasn't developed this mm -hmm. potential to either invade connective tissues or to spread and metastasize, but in others, it, obviously, it does. Yeah, so a definition of neoplasia would be a tissue that is not now under the con normal controls of growth. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, and as I was just saying, in terms of the contrast between ovarian and testicular uh, teratomas, uh, here's an example uh, on the right here of a testicular teratoma in which it's a much more variable lesion. One can get differentiated testicular teratomas that behave in relatively uh, uh, good fashion, low-grade tumours, but there are also malignant teratomas, undifferentiated types, which are much more aggressive. Uh, and finally, uh, on the on the left-hand side, we have the, the seminoma, so-called, of testis, which is, again, another germ cell-derived tumour of the testis in relation to the seminiferous tubules, um, which again is, 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 as I say, a germ cell tumour of testis. Okay, so seminoma, so we've got oma as the suffix there. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm afraid, as I said, I did warn you earlier on yeah, <laughs> that right. unfortunately, you know, we're not talking about semin sarcoma or any other odd, odd uh, combination here. It's, it's, um, the, the term seminoma does imply a malignant tumour of the testis, but it doesn't, it doesn't end in either carcinoma or sarcoma. Yeah. So one has to simply uh, take that uh, on board. So there's a, there's a general rule, but you have to watch out for exceptions. There are exceptions, yeah. indeed. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's just think about some other uh, areas. Um, now I'm beginning to sort of blur the boundaries slightly by, by introducing some of the, if you like, in-between uh, sort of concepts. Um, in terms of breast pathology, a nice example here is of the, uh, the fibroadenoma on the left here, which is a benign tumour of the breast. Uh, as the name implies, it has two components. It has both a connective tissue component, which is the fibro bit, and then an adenoma component, which is the glandular bit. Often these are very circumscribed lesions, as we'd expect for a benign tumour, sometimes described as a breast mouse. And that the... Because it moves around the, inside. Exactly. It's very it's, it doesn't squeak or anything. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, it's simply a very mobile lesion, yeah. you're quite right. Uh, so that's the fibroadenoma. But there is, uh, in breast pathology, um, the idea of, of, of a, of a tumour which is, again, has epithelial and connective tissue components, which is sometimes referred to as the phylloides tumour. And these can look really quite dramatic, as you see in the clinical mm, photograph yeah. here, a really quite rapidly enlarging dramatic uh, lesion. And we have to then look very carefully at the connective tissue component especially, because um, there is a variant, again in a spectrum here, so-called cystosarcoma phalloides, where the connective tissue component becomes malignant. Mm. And it can be very difficult sometimes to distinguish between a fibroadenoma with a very cellular background and that in a phalloides tumour and a malignant phalloides tumour. So we're now introducing the idea that although we have nice categories of benign and malignant, there are in tumour pathology areas in which we see begin to see a spectrum between mm. the two. Mm. So the first thing you need is a good pathologist? I would say so. Yes. <laughs> well, we're hoping to get one of those soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so moving swiftly on. Here's another example of, a, again, where do we put this uh, in terms of our classification? So having given you, again, some basic ideas and basic structure, I'm introducing some, some of the outliers, as it were. Here's a, a so-called molar pregnancy. What are we dealing with here? We're dealing with here a pregnancy which has gone awry, which is not a normal fertilization event. In a molar pregnancy, what we have is a, 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 an abnormal fertilization event in which there is no female com contribution to the genotype, and we get these abnormal chorionic villi forming. So what you're seeing on the left-hand photograph is an opened uterus with these dramatic uh, multivesiculated little fluid-filled cystic spaces, mm -hmm. which are the abnormal chorionic villi proliferating very rapidly, and there isn't any fetus to see in this pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And on the right-hand side, microscopically, this rapidly growing tumour, uh, which um, is a, a molar pregnancy, a complete molar pregnancy. Most molar pregnancies actually uh, can be treated by evacuation of the uterus and patients do well, but the concern here is the particular cell type around the edge of these chorionic villi, known as, as trophoblastic cells, that they then can form a malignant tumour in their own right, known as a choriocarcinoma. Right, because these are quite invasive cells by their very nature, aren't they? They are, exactly. So, so again, a, a, a particular you know, specialised area of tumour pathology, but just to introduce the idea that there are tumours of this type that we also need to be aware of. Okay. So then, in terms of then um, why we have gone to all this trouble of trying to introduce these various terms and think about tumours in general, um, with particularly, of course, trying to pick out the malignant neoplasms. 
And what we're saying here that we have a malignant neoplasm is one in which there is the biological potential to invade adjacent tissues, to metastasize, that is to spread to other parts of the body and to recur despite clinical interventions such as local resection, chemo and radiotherapy. So of all this vast range of tumours that we've been considering and all the terminologies we've been using, the, the bottom line, if you like, is that we're trying very much to identify these tumours so that we can maximise uh, patients', uh, patients uh, care and outlook. Okay. Um, here is an example of a, a tumour which is, is clearly malignant. Uh, I've, this is a bit of a montage taken from different, different areas. Um, and you may want to just maybe look at the four photographs for a moment and ask yourself, where did the tumour start and where has it gone to? Okay, so I've uh, I've got three, and the one I've just realised what the one that looks like a mushroom on the right is as well. <laughs> this is a section of lung in which the last, a last, uh, a large part of the lung is replaced by a malignant tumour. This is a squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. Really, quite an advanced case of squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. And what we have then in the top middle photograph is of the liver, and you can see that there are multiple pale nodules in the liver which indicate metastasis. The liver is a, is a, unfortunately a quite an ideal growing medium for tumours. Mm -hmm. has all the nutrients, temperature and blood supply that a tumour might require. So often tumours will metastasise and grow easily in the liver. I think that's the other thing, isn't it, that uh, particular tumours like to spread to a particular place because the environment for their growth is... Uh, so some there are, so we will list them, but there are a number of tumours that are classically spread to bone quite easily. Indeed, And yep. there are others that won't, so colorectal cancer won't go to bone. It'll be very unusual for it to, yep. but other cancers like breast... Um, do you like to go to bone? Indeed. Uh, and so in this particular case, unfortunately, the patient presented with also uh, brain metastasis. So we have here um, a, a section of brain in which there's a, a lesion you can see on the right-hand side, which is a, a deposit of tumour. And unusually, although it can occur, there's actually a metastasis in the, in the myocardium. This is a, an opened heart showing uh, an area of, uh, of tumour replacement. Wow, that's incredibly unusual. So, so it is very unusual. Maybe some sort of final concluding comments here to say that despite our best efforts in terms of morphological and other methods to classify tumours, I think a famous quote, I'm not quite sure where it comes from, is that tumours don't read textbooks. However, uh, we do our very best and we recognise that there is a continuous range of, pheno of tumour phenotype and uh, that there is often unpredictable biological behaviour in some areas. So we can, uh, thankfully for the most of the common tumours, we've got a pretty good handle on how to classify them and to predict their behaviour. But the tumour pathology is, you know, what makes it challenging and interesting is that there are these different areas where things are much less predictable. And uh, this is a nice photograph, which uh, I think illustrates that point very nicely, where we have a range of, of uh, arch bridges and, and boats. And at MDTs, I often uh, smile when I'm asked the question, is it malignant? Because there is sometimes a difficulty in telling where the bridge stops and where the boats begin. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, um, David. That's, uh, that's incredibly interesting and very, very clear. And it's quite a complex area. So I think you made it very clear. Just in, what would you like people to take home and what are the key points to take away from this? Well, I think that after this uh, presentation, I would hope that the listener is now able to uh, be more familiar with the terms that are used around tumour pathology, to be able to distinguish between, for example, a carcinoma and a sarcoma, to be familiar with the terms of metaplasia, dysplasia, differentiation and so on. And that, I think, is a vital skill for, a, for a training doctors uh, in terms of when they read pathology reports and then able to understand what that report means and act accordingly uh, on it. And, and of course, also to interpret the results to the patient. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming. Okay, thank you.